Here are the solutions to the end-term diagnostic. First question, finding the derivatives. For the very first question, we'll be applying the chain rule because there's a function inside another function. So we can find the derivative, y dash or dy dx, or we'll multiply by this power. So 2 times 5 gives me 10. I'll rewrite this inside function, reduce this power by 1, and multiply by the derivative of that thing inside. So I'll rewrite the first part, and then multiplying by this derivative, which is 2x, and then I can see the 10 and the 2x, multiply those together to get 20x. Okay, so that one's pretty straightforward. Part B is a little bit more complex. In this case, we'll be using the product rule. And I can identify this part is u, and this part is v. So u is square root of x, and v is 5 minus x to the power 4. So to differentiate u, I'll have to write this first as x to the power of a half, and then I can find u dash just by multiplying by a half and reducing this power by 1. To find v dash, I'll have to apply the chain rule. So multiply by 4, which is the power, rewrite the thing inside, reduce the power by 1, and multiply by the derivative of 5 minus x. So we know that the derivative of 5 minus x is minus 1, so v dash is really minus 4, 5 minus x, all cubed. So from here, we can actually substitute all of these in to our product rule u dash v plus u v dash, substitute them in and then see if we can do any simplification. So u dash was a half x to the power minus a half, v is 5 minus x to the power 4, u is square root of x, so I'll write that as just x to the power of a half, and v dash is minus 4, 5 minus x to the power 3. So we've used those four elements that we worked on. So this is correct already. We'll see if we can do any simplification, see if there's any maybe highest common factor between these two. If I look at the numbers, doesn't seem to be any really real high common factor between a half and minus four, but I'll just take out a half as the common factor. What else do we have? We've got x to the power minus a half and x to the power of a half. So from those two, we're going to choose the lowest power. So I'm going to take out x to the power minus a half as my common factor. And then in the 5 minus x's, I'll take the lowest power of those two, which in this case will be 3. So that's my highest common factor. Now that I've taken out that factor inside brackets, I'm going to write what I need to multiply this factor by. So this question mark here to get that original term, okay, to get this first term. So I'll do that step by step. So looking at just the numbers to get from a half to a half. I don't need to do anything, okay, so I don't need any numbers there. Looking at the yellow, negative half to negative a half, it's the same deal. And looking at the 5 minus x's, I've taken out a factor of 5 minus x cubed. I had 5 minus x to the power 4, so I need one more, 5 minus x. So it's really to the power 1, but we won't write that power 1 there. Remember the idea is that these two powers need to add to the original power, which they do. Okay, then looking at the second term, so a half times something to get me minus 4, that'll be minus 8. So I've dealt with the numbers. Looking at my x to the power of minus a half, I've got x to the power of positive a half. So I'm going to need x to the power some number here where minus a half plus that number is going to give me a half. Hopefully you can see that that will be 1. So it's just x to the power 1. And the 5 minus x is, is all sorted out. 
I can then go ahead and uh, simplify in, inside these brackets. So I've got 5 minus x minus 8x. So this is really, so I'll put a fraction line in. The half means divide by 2, so it'll go at the bottom. x to the power minus a half I'll bring to the bottom and make it a positive power, so it should be x to the power of a half. But I'm going to rewrite it straight away into that square root notation. And on the top I have 5 minus x cubed and 5 minus 9x. And that's your fully simplified derivative. Looking at question 2, finding the exact value of these ratios. The first one, sine of pi on 2, I'll draw where pi on 2 is. So there's 0, there's pi, there's pi on 2. So it's exactly on the axis, which means I need to just draw the unit circle around it and look at the coordinates of this point. I know that sine is the y coordinate on the unit circle. So to find sine pi on 2, I'm literally just going to read off whatever the y coordinate is. And I see that the y coordinate is 1, so I can just write down a 1 there. That's all the working I need to show. For part b, cosine of 11 pi on 6. 11 on 6 is pretty close to 2, so that'll give us an idea of whereabouts to draw this thing. I'll draw at my axis. Remember, this is the positive direction, so if I've got an angle that's negative, 11 pi on 6 just means I'm going in this direction, the negative direction. So here's 0, here's minus pi, here's minus 2 pi, minus 11 pi on 6 will be over here somewhere, and this angle in here will be pi on 6, okay, just the physical size of that angle. So I know that cosine 11 pi on 6 Since we're in a quadrant where all of the ratios are positive, I know that's going to be the same as cosine pi on 6, and it's really positive cosine pi on 6, okay, but I don't need that positive there. From there, I can go to my triangles, which I've memorized, and I want to find cosine of pi on 6, so the angle is pi on 6. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so it should be root 2 on 3. Correction, root 3 on 2. And that's that's the working that you're expected to show. A10, 5 pi on 3, I'll do a similar thing. Draw where 5 pi on 3 is. This is a positive angle, so 5 pi on 3 is going to end up over here somewhere. And it's pi on 3 away from 2 pi. It's in a quadrant where only cosine is positive, so it's going to have a negative value, and it's going to be the same as tan of pi on 3. So again, from here, draw your triangle, which you know has pi on 3 in it, and just identify what the tan of that angle is going to be. Tan is opposite over adjacent, so it'll be negative root 3. And finally, part D, sine 2n pi, where n is an integer. So I'm thinking, all right, what happens if n equals 0? 2n pi would be 0. What if n equals 1? 2n pi would be 2 pi. What if n equals 2? 2n pi would be 4 pi. What if n equals 3? 2n pi is 6 pi. So we want to find the sine of pretty much all of these angles. So if I draw my unit circle, I know 0 is there, pi is there, come around, that's 2 pi. Gone around once. If I go around the circle again, that's 4 pi. Go around the circle again, that's 6 pi. So all of these angles they're actually the same angle. Okay, it's just this angle here on the positive x-axis. And remember, when we're trying to find sine of an angle that lies on the axis, all we're doing is drawing the unit circle, marking the coordinates of this point. We know that sine is the y-coordinate. So we can say that sine of 2n pi 
is always going to be zero. That y coordinate of where the angle meets the unit circle. So question three, we're now trying to solve equations. So we're trying to find angles that satisfy a particular equation. I've got an equation here. I first need to rearrange it to get just tan 2x equals something which I can solve. So I'll bring the 1 over and then I'll divide by root 3. Okay, so that's the equation I'm trying to solve. I'm going to first find my acute or basic angle and I'll find that by finding inverse tan of just the positive value. So I'll draw my triangle which I've drawn a few times already so I should be getting pretty good at this. Which angle gives me a tan of 1 on root 3? It's going to be pi on 6 because it'll give me the opposite over adjacent of 1 on root 3. So my basic angle is pi on 6. Now I, I look back at my equation and I see I want to know where tan is negative. So I know that tan is negative in two quadrants which are 2 and 4. So I'll draw up my unit circle diagram. I'll mark pi on 6 here, mark pi on 6 there. So my first two solutions are going to be pi minus pi on 6 and 2 pi minus pi on 6. So I can do that simplification already. I've got 5 pi on 6 and 11 pi on 6. Okay, these are my solutions. Remember I'm solving for 2x, so I'm still solving for 2x there. Um, after solutions for x, so I'll divide all of these by 2. Okay, and then to generate more solutions, I need to add or subtract the period. So the period of that function that I was trying to solve, the b value is 2. I know that b is 2, so the period is going to be 2 pi on b, which is 2 pi on 2, which is pi. So I'm going to keep adding pi to these solutions until they get bigger than 2 pi. Because it's all in twelfths, I'll just think of this as uh, 24 pi on 12 and the period that I'm adding all the time is 12 pi on 12 just to simplify these fractions so here's my first two solutions if I add 12 pi to this first one I'll get 17 pi on 12 compare it to the domain it's under 24 which is good and then I'll add another 12 pi to this second solution I'll get 23 pi on 12 and then if I did that so if I kept adding another 12 pi to this one I would get uh, 29 pi on 12 okay, in which case I'm going to stop because that's outside the domain so it's good just to be as systematic as possible and show that you're rejecting that first solution we wouldn't, in this case, we wouldn't necessarily subtract pi because both of these solutions are smaller than pi, so they'll give us negative solutions straight away, which will be below zero. Okay, but you can do the subtraction if you want. All right, part B, we've got 2 sine x equals cos squared x. Might have to do a bit of work here. So I'll recall that my Pythagorean identity okay, and I've got sines and cosines I want to change them to be both the same so I'm going to change the cos squared to be sine squared so I can rearrange this to 1 minus sine squared theta which means I can rewrite my equation as minus 2 sine x equals 1 minus sine squared x and then it's a case of identifying that as a quadratic equation. Okay, I'll do a substitution to make it look a little bit easier. And 
I go ahead and solve that quadratic equation. So I'm going to bring everything to the left hand side to make it equal to zero. And then I'm going to go ahead and factorize. So I'll use cross method. 2m's need to multiply to minus 1 and add to minus 2. So I try as hard as I can to try and find these two numbers that will work to get minus 1, 1 and minus 1, but crossing it gets me nothing, minus 1 and 1. So I, I can't factorize it, so I'll, I'll solve using graphics calculator. So I'll just do this quickly. This equation mode. Uh, I've got a so I've got a polynomial of second degree because it's a quadratic, and I've put in my a, b, and c. So one minus two and minus one. And then I go go ahead and solve it. And here are my two solutions. So m equals these two values. So two point four one four and the other one is m equals minus zero point four one four. Okay remember that these are the solutions directly. If I was factorizing I'd have m minus something, m minus something else, and then set these equal to zero and solve. But on the graphics calculator it just gives us the solutions directly. Okay, so we'll remember that we replaced sine x with m. So we can go ahead and do that reverse substitution. And we've set ourselves two equations to solve, and our domain is 0 to 2 pi again. So in this first solution, okay, we're going to get no solutions. You should know that straight away. Okay, since sine x is between minus 1 and 1. Okay, just imagining the graph from 1 to minus 1. You're never going to get a sine value that's greater or less greater than 1 or less than minus 1. On this other side, we'll find the acute angle. We'll find what inverse sine of positive this value is. The inverse sine of 0.414. So that's my angle, 0 0.427. I'm looking for where is sine negative. So I know it's negative in quadrants 3 and 4. So I'll draw this up and put my acute angle of 0 0.427 in both these spots. So my solutions are going to be pi plus pi plus 0 0.427 and 2 pi minus 0 0.427. So I'll go to my calculator and find what they are. So there's my two solutions, 3.57 and 5.86. Okay, remember I should then really add 2 pi to these to generate more solutions. But if, if I did that to this first solution, it's going to give me something that's outside the domain. Okay, I get 9.85, which is outside this domain. Remember, 2 pi is like 6.28. So they're my two solutions for extra communication and justification marks. I'll, I'll check just one solution works. I'll check the 3.57 one, and I'll sub it into that original equation. So into minus 2 sine x equals cos x all squared. So I'll just substitute it into both sides and find what these two values are. Putting it in the left-hand side, and putting it in the right hand side and just calculating both of these so I get 0 0.83 and 0 0.83
Okay, which means the result is justified. It's always good to check at least one or two over the course of the exam. Alright, sketching functions should be relatively straightforward. This is in a slightly different order than it normally would be. If you really can't deal with that, you can write it in the correct order, just changing the two terms around. So I can identify from here that a equals minus 3, which means it's an amplitude of 3. And since it's a negative sine graph, it's going to start at the average value and look like that. I can identify that the b value is a half, which means the period of my graph will be 2 pi on b, which is 2 pi on a half. So we have a period of 4 pi. And a d value of 5. Remember we're matching this up to a sine bx plus d. d value of 5 means the average value is 5. Okay, so this will be enough for me to draw the graph from 0 to 4 pi. So I'll draw my axes. So my period is 4 pi and I'm graphing to 4 pi, so that's convenient. So I'll just mark 4 pi somewhere over here. I'll make that pi, make that 2 pi, 3 pi, and 4 pi. I've got it divided into four sections, which is good. My average value is 5. So I may as well go up 5, might go up in 2's, hopefully I'll have enough room. My average value is 5, so maybe in a different coloured pencil I might put a little line through 5, knowing that's the average value. The amplitude's 3, so I'm going to go 3 above and below that line. So it's going to be bounded by those three lines. Okay, since it's a negative sine graph, it's going to start at its average value and then go to its minimum value, go back to its average value, up to its maximum, and down to its average value again. So my graph. I'm going to look something like this. And I've sketched it from 0 to 4 pi as required. How can you check that it's right? Put it in your graphics calculator and just write verified with graphics calculator on your exam paper. I'm going to do exactly the same thing for part B. So I'll identify this is already in the right form. So A equals 10, which means the amplitude is 10, b value of 4, which means the period is 2 pi on b, period is 2 pi on 4, so my period is pi on 2. And I've got a d value of minus 2, which means my average value is minus 2. So I'll have to draw up my axes going from 0 to 2 pi, but I've only got a period of, of pi on 2. So I know straight away that between 0 and 2 pi, it's going to be happening lots in there. Okay, Probably four periods within that domain. Draw your axes. So I've got my axes x, y all sorted. Same as in that previous example, my average value is minus 2. So I can draw a line through minus 2. And I need to go 10 above and 10 below. So 10 below would be to minus 12. 10 above would be to 8. So I've just drawn that in pencil. I'll rub it out when I finish. It's a cosine graph, which means it'll start at the maximum and do things like that. So starting at the maximum, going to the average value, to the minimum, to the average value, to the maximum. This is my first cycle. And I can repeat that cycle for the rest of the graph. Hey, there it is. And I should probably write the equation of it on there as well. Yeah, it's a good habit to get into. Final equation to have a go at is to try and determine the equation of this graph below. So before we even think about A's and B's and C's and things like that, just remember that 
cosine graph looks like that, sine graph looks like that. So the negative versions of these looks horrible. And much better. So that's negative cosine and this is negative sine. Straight away as I look at this, I notice that it's starting at its minimum value. Negative cosine is the one that starts at its minimum value. So I'm trying to fit this to a negative cosine graph, which means it'll be y equals minus a cos bx plus d. And then we'll just go ahead and find a, b, and d. So to find a, we're looking for the amplitude which we can find by the difference between the max and the min and divide that through by 2. So the maximum value is 1, minimum value minus 3. I'll have an amplitude of 2 or an A value of 2. To find the B value, so I'll put this in a box and use it later. To find the B value, my relationship is the period is 2 pi on B. My period is going to be the distance between these corresponding points. I know this distance is pi on 3, and I know this distance is also pi on 3. Okay, so I know my period is going to be 2 pi on 3. So instead of writing period, I can write 2 pi on 3 equals 2 pi on b, and then I can solve that and I'll get b equals 3. Okay, so. Solve B equals 3. The final piece of information I need is the D value, which is my average value, which I'm going to find by the average of the maximum and the minimum. So I'll add them together and divide by 2. Maximum was 1, minimum was minus 3. I'll have an average value of minus 1. I put this in a box as well. So my equation will be y equals, remember it's negative, my a value of 2, cosine of 3x, and then plus d, it's really minus 1. And I can highlight it, whatever, be really proud of it, because you found the equation of a trig graph, which is pretty good.